Um, good evening. Good evening. I'm Luni. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I don't want to wait for too long. Um, please um, raise your hand or give me an indication if you can hear me so that I know that I am audible. Um, hi, we. Tanbonani. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, thank Hello. you. Thank you, Paul. I can see you can you can hear me. Um, I didn't want to waste time because um we have load shedding, hence the weird um light. We have load shedding, and um with load shedding, sometimes the network goes away. So I'm hoping that at least it allows me to finish because I'm using my phone as a as a hotspot. My name is Nombeli Sombanga. I am the founder of Teen Coaching, and we specialize with um, the emotional well-being of young people, youth um, as a whole, from 10 to 35 years of age, because South Africa's youth is up to 35 years of age. Um, I'm going to get going because the session is around an hour. And what I'll probably do, I'll first tell you why I'm doing this session. And then I'm going to ask you questions with regards to your young adults and their age groups and what they do currently. Um, so this conversation or this call has been motivated by a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of things. One of the reasons why it became necessary for me was that for the past um, six months, if not even a year or more, I've been um, attempting to employ a couple of um, young people into my business. And by young people, I mean your plus 25 year olds, because I usually look for 25, 26, 27 year olds. And I've just moved back to um, the Eastern Cape, my hometown. And we were talking with my colleague in terms of the differences between the young people from small town versus the young people from your bigger towns. And by, by young people, we refer to your plus 19, 21, 25 years of age. And we also realize that there's sometimes a possibility that a young person can be the Here we go again. I'm sorry about that. It's the network. So I'm holding my fingers because um, load shedding is trying to sabotage me. Um, so we noticed that there's a huge um, development gaps between young people from small towns versus the young people in, in bigger towns. But also we noticed that even in the bigger towns, there's a skills problem with young adults. Um, by skills problem, I feel like um, we usually look at qualifications, but we don't look at um, soft skills and we don't look at um, resilience and all of those things that they need within the work sector. We also, because I work in this space, um, we've, I've also noticed that 
even with the young adults that get into varsity, into tertiary, in that first year, they get hit by a deep depression. It's either they, they try to commit suicide and they, um, they, they drop out of varsity. And this is something that you can even check um, with institutions close to where you are at. One of the biggest institutions that has a high rate of um, suicide um, at varsity, it's um, Vets and it's um, Grahamstown. And this is based, and also, um, um, what do you call it? There is another institution here in the Eastern Cape that also has a high rate of, of suicide. The other one that's a problem is um, a TVT college here in the Eastern Cape. Their problem is that the first years and second years, there's a high rate of pregnancy within their young adults, which often leads to the females dropping out of um, tertiary. You find that um, when we speak about teen pregnancy, we focus at primary school and in high school, and we don't look at, um, at, at first year um, college students. So that's also a thing. So I'm calling this because we want to look at ways that we can shape support for young people. But also I want to hear with from parents, what are you dealing with in terms of your young adults? Um, and then I'll tell you more based on the work that I do with teens, some of, some of the things that might assist you as parents if you have young adults. And also I'll take you through some of the developmental notes that we often look at on our side in terms of from zero to 12 years of age, your young person should be in primary school, 12 to 13 years of age. And also from 13 to 18 years of age, they must be in high school and complete high school by 18 years of age. And when we look at coaching um, young adults from our side, if there is a 20, 21 year old or 22 year old um, young person who is still stuck in high school, we often see that as a red flag, which means there are certain developmental things that this young person might have missed in their journey of growing up. So before I continue, I want to know, um, please let me know um, how old is your young person? Um, what are they doing? Are they studying? Um, are they um, out of school? This is gonna give me an indication in terms of how to, how to drive this conversation. And also what I'll do is I'll also give you a chance to ask me questions and then I'll give you potential mm -hmm. solutions for your young adult. Um, so anyone can raise their hand and then I'll allow you to speak so just to give me a brief, how old are your young adults and what are they currently doing? Just briefly. Yes, NM? Um, yes, Mama. <laughs> it can be you. <laughs> what a it nice surprise. <laughs> so I couldn't change my work Zoom, so um, I'm sorry for that. It's, it's all right. It's together. It's good to um, see you. But um, nice to see you as well. Thank you very much for this uh, session. I know that we're going to learn uh, quite a lot. Hmm. Um, I'm I I'm not a mother obviously, okay. <laughs> but I am a mother. Uh, I think as an African, I do have a nephew who is okay. I have two nephews. But the one that is relevant, I think, uh, for this particular session is uh, the one that's 20, 24. He's about okay. to turn twenty five years old, and um, he went to uh, college to Rosebank College, but. Okay. He stopped. He he failed, and then he just then he decided that no, he, he he's done. He will just start looking for um for for employment. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that I, I think I'd like to to touch on maybe is also parenting a child that isn't necessarily yours biologically. You yes. know, because as much as it takes the village. Sometimes there can be issues there um, yes. that are difficult for me to deal with as the person who, who um, it's not my child's mm. child, so I don't have the ultimate. Yeah, okay. thank you. Tell me, tell me, is the part is the um is the your nephew's parents still alive or they passed away? Um, the mom is still alive. It's my sister. Um, okay. Okay. And the the father is not what's it uh, present at all. He's, Never be fine. 
That's fine, Mama. Thank you so much. Um, Pearl, your hand is up. Thank you, thank you, Sissi. Hi. Yes, Mama. Afternoon, everyone. Evening. Is it evening? Yes. It's, it's evening, yes. So I just want to know the age of your young person. Are they currently at school mm -hmm. or not really? Um, the young one is 16. Okay. And he's in grade nine. Okay. Um, he failed grade three when he was in primary. So yeah, he's a bit behind with age. And then um, the older one is 23. Okay. He was studying tourism, but he's, I think he's quitting. Like, yeah. <laughs> You know him. He's been to your, to one of your camps, um, and yeah, I'm just that parent. That's just you know, I'm I'm hoping to you know get to understand how they think. What is it that makes them not to want to continue with certain things? He wants to do music. I'm saying no, <laughs> do something. Okay. And I don't know if I'm wrong or right, but yeah, <laughs> that's my journey. All right. Thank you um, so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pam. So I'm going to be quick cool. in this because I want to get through to everyone. So I'm going to say um, the next person can just raise their hand and I'll, and I'll call you out. I'm trying to find some order or some process and Paul. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Hi, Paul. My daughter is 18. She turned 18 this year. Okay. Um, she's currently temping as a receptionist. So she... She's in a gap year type of vibe. And then, but she was accepted at after to study motion picture next year. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Zodwa. Um, good evening, ladies. I good am glad it's getting dark on the entry, so I'm not able to show my face. That's okay. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for the meeting and the topic. Uh, I don't have a, a young adult of my biologically uh, as a parent, but I, I have a stepson who is 18, who's 19 this year. He just started first year at university. Yeah, I really, since he's out of the house, I really don't know how to connect with them. I don't know what their problems are. They're just, they're just away. Okay. They wouldn't. They, they, they don't call, they don't say anything. So I just want to know how best to handle such um, uh, people they, uh -huh. as they grow up and especially that they don't live with us. All right. Thank you so much, Zodra. Um, so if you want to talk, um, just to give me, if you want to give me your, your young person's age and um, details, please raise your hand so that I can just keep calling you out. Um, if you don't want to talk, I will see you by not raising your hand. Um, so the next person is Boitu Melo. Yes, you can post. Yes, perfect. You can post on the chat as well. I can read um, from the chat. So you don't have all to speak. Even better. Actually, that's even better. If you all can, can post on the chat, I will see it and I will then drive my conversation based on that. But you can talk, Boitume, I'll you be the last person, then I'll read um, the, the, the chats. Wait, Melo, I think your sound is, um, oh, you're on mute. Okay, so I take it everyone is going to write on um, the chat bar in terms of your young person's age and what they currently do. What usually happens a lot is, so what I'm going to try and do is I'm gonna try and give you um, the, the content that I'm going to be talking about is based mostly on the black young person because that is often who we often speak to the most. But um, also this is inclusive of um, black um, labeled as colored um, young person because we usually have a similar, a similar um, history. Um, I'm gonna start with um, stats um, because I, I like reading stats up a lot. If you look at, um, the CSIR um, and other institutions inclusive of research content from the different universities. 
if you look deeply into those stats, you'll find that the biggest um, dropouts um, are black young person, black young people. And um, the biggest dropouts in terms of the first year, we hold the space mm -hmm. in terms of young people from the black community who drop out of, um, of either varsity or college, we lead in that space. Um, and this is going to speak to the comment that was made, I think, by um, Pearl about uh, why they why they quit. And I'm going to mention a few things that makes um, young black young people to quit um, either varsity or college in the first year. Um, so check the stats; you'll find them with the biggest dropout. Um, and then also. When you look at the number of black young people that enter either college or um, and either college or um, or university, the percentage of young people from the black community that graduate are literally around thirty percent or twenty percent in comparison with the other races. So we literally are at the bottom of um the of, of all the issues and the social issues that cause our young people to either make it in varsity or not make it so I'm, you can read all of those from the different universities so one of the or some of the factors that has influenced mm -hmm. this dropout rate in tertiary for our people or our young people is the fact that a lot of the time our children are not ready for varsity emotionally they are not ready for varsity emotionally. We have spent a lot of time from high school controlling what they eat, controlling what they do, controlling where they go, controlling um, how they think, controlling everything about them. But the, by the time they get to varsity, their first year, varsity or college, they have this freedom and they don't know what to do with it because for the first time, they now have the freedom to think for themselves, to choose what they wear, to choose what they eat. And most of the time they're ill prepared for that. The second thing that speaks to the dropout grade is academic performance. From grade eight to grade 12, we tend to want to control when they study and how they study um, to a point where our children tend to develop an ability of assuming that they are studying for our benefit as parents or, because, or they think they're doing us a favor. When they get to tertiary, any form, Mama, oi, level like I... they then don't... Is there any meeting or it's an guy? Then they're not prepared for the level of work that is um, that is done at varsity and at college. So often, what then happens is that they don't make it to the exam to the exam room at the end of the year because they don't qualify to write exams. And most of the time, they do not even know that they're supposed to be qualifying because they were not paying attention to other first part of the year. The other challenge that we have is that our children tend to have a very low EQ, which is an emotional um, quotient. Um, yes, sometimes they can be great in terms of academics, but in terms of emotional intelligence, most cases they do not show up there. They don't know um, what they know and what they do not know. And they tend to be know-it-alls. And in most cases, the information that they know is not enough to take them through the first phases of um, the, their young adult's life. So these are the things that often impact them as they make life. The other thing, um, other things that I wanted to touch on was um, family dynamics. And this is probably where I'm going to sit at the most because in the cases um, that I've seen, I'm going to use university as, a, as an example. In the cases that I have seen of depressed um, university students, a big chunk of the cases uh, that we see, um, their biggest issues are family dynamics. And by family dynamics, I mean parents who divorced during their phase of either primary school or high school. Um, issues, within family, um, issues within the family that spring up um, or that show up in their mind when they start varsity or colleges. The thing about being a young person is that when you are a child, you can create your own understanding of what is happening in your family. You can create your own language in trying to understand what is happening in your family 
or your mind can block it out so that you don't have to think about what is happening in your family. In most cases, kids tend to be privy of the secrets that people are hiding in their family, but they, but they block all of these things out. What then tends to happen is that when they are around 18, 19, 20 years of age, they start remembering things. They start remembering what happened at certain stages of their childhood life. And when that happens, they often do not have support or anyone that they can that they can run to who's going to help them unpack the stuff that's going on in their mind. And usually the effects can be jumbled or mixed up in terms of how they remember things. That is why you often find that young adults tend to keep or portray a lot of anger or they tend to binge drink a lot, or they tend to party a lot because they're trying to put into context things that they might not have the full language or the recollection of because these are things that happen within their families. Some young adults, because we live with millennials now, they tend to have the courage to ask parents, Zuguti, what was happening here? Or why did my mom leave? Or why did my dad leave? Or how did my mom pass away? And then what often happens in the family's front is that we don't want to talk. We don't want to address certain things because we didn't think the kids were away when certain things were happening in our family. And this is one of the things that contribute to the high rate of suicidal, suicide ideation amongst Black young people. This is one of the other thing that impacts them a lot is relationships. When they get, when they leave home after grade 12, they start to date and they start to explore relationships. And often they are ill prepared for that world. They make a lot of mistakes. And then when the mistakes happen, they take things very, very hard and then they don't know how to recover from them. And when those things are jumbled around or when the, all, all those things happen at the same time, it's relationship things here happening, it's family things happening or coming up in terms of remembrance, it's academic life, it's varsity and social life. Those things sometimes can overly get a young person to quit at different stages of their lives because they did not build enough resilience and resolve to make life work. Um, so that's the one part. So I'm going, so the, uh, the one person um, asked Guti, if you are um, a, a, a young person, or if you're an aunt or that you are assisting your family members in terms of assisting them either to finish school or to get them to pay attention to their life. The thing about young adults is that they believe they know everything. They believe they know everything. So in most cases, they tend to not listen to family members offering them advice. Unless you have a particular relationship with them, they tend to not listen. What tends to work best for them is to give them or to ask them the kind of resources that they need in order for them to make certain decisions for themselves, certain informed decisions for themselves. Because what often tends to happen, they kind of depict us as Abantu who are always preaching to them all the time and not giving them a chance to make decisions for themselves. What I then tend to do is to say to them, these are, so you, you almost have to give your young person um, information that's going to guide them to make the right decisions for themselves. But also, if you're coming in as a support to their parent, you have to keep mindful of the fact that you're not trying to compete with that parent, but you'll be in support of them. And as far as possible, try and get that other parent involved in the conversation so that it doesn't come across as if you're trying to play the mother or compete with the mother because sometimes young adults view it that way. The other important thing though is that sometimes young adults do not believe that they are worthy of certain space. They don't believe that they, they, they deserve to be at university or they don't believe that they deserve to go to tertiary because a lot of their mindset might have been sh might shaped and, and influenced by how they did high school and primary school. I've met this quite a lot where young people feel like there's no one in my family that has gone to university. And therefore I don't believe that I'm worthy to be in these spaces. They sabotage a lot. Or if the person um, who's trying to assist them is the only person in the family who's gone to university, they cannot touch that person. But also if the entire family 
is known to be a um, family of um, advocates and lawyers and engineers and, and, and whatnot. Sometimes there is one young person within the family unit who chooses to be a black sheep of the family, meaning they try and go against every value and every direction of the family because they want to define themselves in a particular way. And often when that happens, they will go against all the rules of the family. It then requires a particular type of mm -hmm. wisdom for you to allow them space to explore who they want to be, to, but to a point where you also then push them away because you want them to come for you for help when they need it the most. I'm going to stop here and just check my comments and see. Um, father of a 17-year-old in grade 12. Um, all right. Can the father of the 12th, oh, my daughter is 21 in varsity. She dropped out first year. How to continue the support so it doesn't happen again. Um, boy to Melo. So the one thing, because I know I know you're, you're, you're a young person, um, is that the tricky part about young adults is that they will not listen when it counts the most. Not to family, they will not listen. Um, and also, if they feel like there are certain unresolved family issues, um, they will not listen to family members. What you then need to do is to get someone who's external from a family unit to support them. Look within your network, look at your friends with that you know that your, 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 your daughter can listen to them so that they get someone neutral to guide them into the process of getting them somewhere. The other thing about it as well is that some young adults might not flourish at varsity um, in terms of academic spaces, but they might um, flourish in other spaces inclusive of them exploring um, entrepreneurship, but also inclusive of them exploring um, the creative sector because there are different things that they can do there. Sometimes, sometimes by Dumelo, um, young adults chose the wrong career field. When they then get to varsity, they realize that this is not for them. And, but then they're also afraid to say so because you've already paid a lot of money in and they're afraid of disappointing you. But then it's, it's just not working out. So then what it might require you to do also, one thing first, you might, you might need to ask them, would you want to talk to somebody else to help you to find um, your next thing to explore? Or you can ask them directly, how would you want me to support you as a mom? that you listen to them. The frustrating thing for most parents is the fact that you want your child to succeed and you know that, that the potential to succeed at that given moment then you do not um, be, be, uh, be taking your advice from it. And then the other last thing that I want to say is that sometimes, and I think this is the hardest part, is that sometimes we need to look at ourselves and admit to good team. Sometimes our children have their own path and their own choices to make and sometimes their own mistakes to make. And it might not be nice um, for us to admit that because you want to give them the best. But then the best way to mitigate the extent, the depth of those mistakes is to get them somebody else to talk to them. Um, and somebody else, um, in this case, not even me, <laughs> um, look, at, look at, your, at your network and look at someone um, and also look at your child's interest and their talents and find someone that they can talk to who will be able to guide them. The weird thing about um, both teenagers and young adults, they tend to listen a lot to strangers um, more than they do family and parents. It is a, it's a weird thing about being a, a person because you want, they want to self-actualize and they want to create their own independence away from family. So they tend to listen more to strangers. And then the other thing, if this applies to everyone. If you decide um, to get your young person um, um, a life coach or any other form of support, please uh, let them stay the course. Or um, because th the challenge that we have is, I know this happens a lot in the coaching space, we want a child to go to one, two, three sessions and we want them to figure things out in those two or three sessions. And yet what usually happens, and I'll say from my experience, what usually happens the most in that first coaching session, even psychologists, they have the same similar issue. In that first coaching session, you are still getting to know the person and you want them to, you want to win them over for them to trust you. In the second, second session, you are 
they are helping you're helping them define themselves to their own selves or they introduce themselves to you so that you know more about who they are it makes it easy for you to guide them and then the first part the third part is you look at their childhood their primary school their history and how they grew up and how they handled high school, primary school how they interacted with their teachers and the mindset that got developed or the belief system that got developed there and then the next thing is you talk about high school and then we talk about their peers, their friends and decisions that they make within there. And then we talk about dating and Jolo. Sometimes that could take literally close to three to six hours, six, six, six sessions, because you'd find that they quit school or they quit varsity because one, um, they met the, a boyfriend that dumped them in high school and they're battling to process that. Or... The, the situation from, from primary school or high school where they feel like they don't believe they're worthy enough of where they are right now in their lives or mistakes that they are still um, punishing themselves for. So it has to be a long drawn process. And I think this is why in our case, we start the whole coaching thing at 10 years of age, because we understand that at 10 years, we can intervene quite earlier in terms of day-to-day -day challenges. You must remember that every young person, in fact, every grown person, every situation that they experience yearly, monthly, daily, it sometimes can leave an imprint in terms of how they make decisions for their lives. Um, I'm gonna check another person comments. My son, 19, grade 12, we're having difficulty with agreeing on what to start in next year. Um, he suddenly has lunch, lunch love, oh, lunch love for cooking. He wants to do hospitality and I disagree. Can I talk to Uvuvu? Uvuvu, please come jump on. Because if you disagree, you, you must also be mindful, Guti. Um, a career path is their decision. And it is, um, yes, a parent can guide, like you can guide your child in terms of what they, what they can choose. But when you disagree, with a particular path, what are your reasons for disagreeing? Is it because when you just don't like it um, or you feel like it's too expensive or you feel like, or you don't see your child doing it um, because you had a certain vision for them? Um, so I'd love to ask you, Bubu, why do you disagree? <laughs> oh. Hi, Sissy. Hi, everyone. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I don't really disagree with what he wants. Mm -hmm. It's just that the experience that we all had during the, the COVID season that we had, so it actually made me um, maybe get to a point where I wouldn't want him to be in the hospitality nor the, or the tourism industry. Okay. Because even today, there are people that still don't have jobs. Mm. For me, he needs to do something that tomorrow or even in the next 10 or 15 years that he can, he can chop and change jobs and mm. something that can, he can grow from other than when we do have another pandemic in whenever we have that pandemic, then he just stays at home and have nothing to do. Can I ask so what are, I what are his um can I ask what are his um top um his core subjects currently? Does he have history, geography, and tourism? Does he have pyramids? He no, he's got metlets. Okay. So can I just look? okay? I'm gonna respond. You, you can mute. I'm gonna tell you now. Can I respond? So, okay. You know, my the the problem is that um, I was going to talk about career development and I was going to advise parents that the best time for a young adult to prepare or to define their career development is from grade nine. Né? Um, so if your child um, is in grade, in, in grade 12, they, they are dis, they, their life path or their career choice is driven by a choice that they made when they were in grade, in grade nine. I'll make an example. So in your case, your child currently has doesn't have pure meds and has geography, history, and um and 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 tourism. And the kind of, of career path that they are choosing for themselves 
is around hospitality. And purely because there's a high chance that it's because they now realize that they cannot do their ideal career path because of the current subject choices that they have. Né? Because a lot of the so-called great career choices or career paths or career or courses um, are often outside of the pure math stream. So if your child is in grade 12 and they do not have pure maths and they have geography and they have history and tourism, it limits what they can do. So your son probably look, looked at um, admission requirements in different varsities and realized I do not qualify in most spaces. The other thing that's going to be a factor could be the academic marks as well. So if your son has maths literacy, geography, tourism, and might be sitting below 50% in terms of academic marks and overall below 50%. It limits and closes almost a lot of things for them. So the best thing that then they do is they look at the next um, possible career path that they can do. And this is probably why they landed at hospitality. They're probably aware too that hospitality in the country is, is, is. they're probably aware. But what then, um, where, where often sometimes coaching or another thing mentorship comes in is that if they then choose to do hospitality or choose the, the, the tourism or hospitality route, the route, they need to be aware of the kind of challenges that are there. And then they must make a decision to be the best in that field because it does happen that even in a highly, highly busy and infiltrated industry, it does happen that certain talents, they make it and they thrive in those spaces, but their mindset needs to be in a particular space, the way they view themselves, the way they view the world of work, the way they attempt um, to do work and their work ethic, it needs to be at a certain point. So I understand your son because he probably looked at um, the subject choices that he has currently in the marks, and then they realize there's nothing. So it will be frustrating um, for, 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 for him to try and push him into certain careers that he might not even qualify for them. And the other thing that is even made even for me sometimes difficult to coach grade 12s is that it's so difficult, difficult to say to a grade 12, but you made the wrong choices in grade nine. Um, I've met um, children in grade 12 that want to do medicine and they have met lit tourism and geography and they might even be doing well in those subjects but you don't need you can't use those to get into the medicine stream because they made the wrong decision when they were doing grade nine so my recommendation now cc is when you get home Take your, your son's um, school report, use June this year, the school report, sit with him and then go to the different university admission pages and go and check what courses do, does he qualify for. But do this exercise together, not you alone or him alone, do it together. And when you do it together, do it in a calm and not shouting as way as possible because Tina's like, kind of Melissa so that he's able to see what are the requirements um, um, or where does his subject choices fit in. And then once you've done that exercise, he then needs to check himself, Uguchi, where are his interests mostly sitting at most of the time? What does he enjoy doing? What can he do? And then see what, if he can filter those things down. In most cases, if you can't do it, get him to get someone to mentor him in terms of um, guiding him to that space, or he can walk into different um, tertiary institutions, the admission departments, and ask the, and ask that he be guided in terms of how to make those choices. Né? Um, I hope that helps us, Bubu. Um, my daughter, seventeen, grade twelve. Um, so, if your children are in grade twelve this year, um, it's late. They should have applied already for. Uh, or some of some of the applications are open right now, some are not. Um, but make make sure that you check all your applications and preferably um, apply um, at more than three institutions, um, and also have them choose at least a minimum of three career options mm -hmm. or course options. Um, I don't have a young adult. I'm a deputy parenting my siblings. My brother is 28 years old, college dropout. He cannot stick to any job. He does. 
touch and go manifests. So with young people that drop out often, um, there's something that happens where we build a habit of not finishing things. No? Um, so in these cases, it's going to be difficult for you to do anything much. Um, but what you can do is you can negotiate with your, um, your brother, um, negotiate in terms of allow him or to have a conversation about what makes him drop out of things. Um, I had a conversation recently with a group of young adults, similar to what we're doing now, a few session where one of the young adults mentioned that she keeps, um, she keeps um, leaving jobs and resigning often. And when we spoke deeply about it, she realized that each time she reaches a pressure point or when she feels challenged, she wants to quit um, because and it's because she had not yet built a resilience. She doesn't, she doesn't know, or she has she had not built um, enough resilience to push herself through. So each time she experiences a challenge, she drops out. So then, but you then have to find the source of that, like where is that coming from? Is it something that within the family where people do not complete things? Or is there a way that your young person is, is reviewing or viewing the people in his life or also his own experiences where he just got into a habit of not completing things. And then once you are able to have that open conversation about him not completing things, you then ask him to start something that he can complete so that he can then learn to trust himself again. And then when I implement Naya that says, once you complete this one basic thing, check what is not something that's too expensive. Once you complete this one basic thing, we will then lead you to the next to the next thing that you can do. But there needs to be a conversation first so that they understand that they might have gone or find themselves in a habit where they are sabotaging themselves. Um, let me check, check, check. Eight, eleven. I'm disagreeing with my son. Oh, the guy music. Because he went from grade nine to his um, so I'm saying who well, because music and and young adults, no, um, so he doesn't help my trick. He needs to complete his N three and N four in order for him to study music. What is happening is that he's now focusing on creating music beats for people, but his schoolwork has been suffering. He does not qualify to write some exams because he's not submitting assignments. I'm very frustrated at this point. Um, so at this point, get him. Let me just check, are you the parent? He went from grade nine to grade 10 level, what I say. So again, it's that tourism thing. Um, I wish the government can remove tourism from schools, yes. Um, this is me now being political. <laughs> <laughs> This is making political. I wish they could just remove tourism because it's playing with the kids in a deep way. Um, he didn't and want to do business. It's, it's, it's playing yeah, with business. Them. He didn't want to do it. No, sure, 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 sure. So the thing about music, no? a lot of the young people want to do music. Um, the only thing that I can tell is that they will not stop, but have an agreement. No? Now nah, what that says, um, you will need... Co so So... We were talking about this when we were doing the series around parenting teams that says you need to be um, a student of your child's um, interests and talents. So if your child is into music, check which genre of music are they interested in. Né? For an example, if they're into hip hop, you need to figure out who's doing well in, in hip hop in the country and what makes them do well. Do they get an education or not? Because if your son, um, has an idol in that music stream that has not gone to university or varsity or finished school like with Casper in your vest, you're going to have problems. That's, that's the guy. <laughs> <He's running out. laughs> so I love if, him, but yeah. <laughs> so if the idol is Casper in your vest, you're going to have problems because Casper in your vest did not complete my trick. He is living large and, 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 and. But then you need to be smart and say, okay, Check out what you can spend your vest and then look at his work ethic. He is the kind of person or artist who doesn't dabble in just doing beats only. He has a very wide scope in terms of what he gets involved in. And then check what is who is Casper Nervest following the most. And also what are they all about? In most cases, Casper loves Jay-Z. Jay-Z is a completely different artist altogether. So what I then say to parents, if your child has Jay-Z linked anywhere there, 
Jay's is a business mogul and also check, he's got books, get your child books that they can read how the music industry is run. Because then what happens is they realize booty, it's a lot of work because Bona, they, is, they assume it's just showing up at the, at the club and playing music and it's fun and you get paid. They don't take into consideration the work that they need, they need to put in. And then once they see that, we then talk about them developing a work ethic and sometimes schooling or the act of schooling, writing exams, writing assignments, it develops one's work ethic. And that's how we then drive that conversation. And then you have to then be wise about it and say, if you complete your ends, your entry or your first year diploma, I'll get you a sound system. I know it sounds crazy, but that's what I do. <laughs> I'll get you a sound system to set you up, but I need you to first have a basic, um, a basic qualification. The other thing also that could help is look at other artists in the country, how they have struggled with no basic education because Ocas University is one of um, one of those um, who kind of made it, but others, they didn't make it. Others are still struggling even now. So then you need to be that parent who knows who is there in the music industry. What did they gain? What did they lose? And then drive those conversations that way because you're not going to win if you say, don't do music. I don't want you in the music industry. Da, 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 da. You're not going to win because they're going to think you don't know what you're talking about. But when you educate yourself, and be familiar with what's happening in the music industry, they can listen to you because now you speak a language that's similar to them. You know? So please try that and see where it takes you. If anything else fails, get them someone to talk to. This is my go-to space. Get them someone to talk to, then you can, well, you can focus on validating and supporting them. Um, let me just check the other things and then... Okay, so before um, before I, I I I I check the comments again, um, let me just check my notes. Um, so one of the things that also made me do this conversation is when parents enable um the wrong values within their children. When parents enable, when you become enablers of the wrong things, I'll make an example. It happens quite often when. Um, a young person leaves, um, say they have matric, um, they then don't make the right decisions in terms of getting to tertiary. So they're sitting at home um, and they're not interested in anything. But you then do, you become that parent who gives them pocket money. They go drinking every weekend. They have all the nice label clothes. They have money, they have a car, they drive your car from one place to another. Um, and then you as a parent, you are frustrated because you don't see them earning or driving anything in terms of their lives. And you're wondering what is happening with this person. And then they come to me and I would say, oh, actually, of course, they don't have any reason to work for anything because everything is provided for them. And in most cases, when I speak to parents, they would say, but I'm trying to make my son or my child, because often it's sons, I, I'm trying to make my son be comfortable so that when he meets his peers, he doesn't feel like he's not working. And that's where the problem lies. They must know and feel when they are not working. Because once you provide everything to a young adult, who is not making an effort, you are rewarding the wrong behavior. Let's talk about this. Ask me a question, raise your hand. Let's talk about this. When you, when you know you've been enabling the wrong thing. So I'm not saying chase your kids out to the street. I'm saying provide shelter, provide food, but they also must, must um, put some effort in terms of doing other things as well. Um, I just wanna check if there's any questions around this enabling, 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 enabling. Any questions so far? Um, I think that's not of guys. I think my issue is how does one get the young adult to make use of the resources around them? There's the internet and there's YouTube. So the problem is that they do not think that they need to use those things because they know it all. So that's the problem. And this is a problem that most young adults in the country have. They do not believe that um, they, they need to use, they need to learn anything new because they, they, they can. Um, 
I will call you on the side. Okay, sure, Pam. Um, sure, Danny, I can. Okay, Pearl. Um, um, so who is NM? Is it NM? So how to get young people to, 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 to use the resources? Please give them tasks, give them activities, and give them things to do so that um, it drives them to those, to those resources. So if a person is sitting at home, not doing anything, and there's internet and stuff in the house, please give them things to do, like a task to do. Like if they're talking about going to, oh, we want, I want to go and study next year, ask them, Guti, where are you going to study? And also give them the tools in terms of saying, um, check university of so-and-so, check college of so-and-so, and let me know what you think. Because you also want them to be the drivers of this conversation without you providing them the answers. Just guide them in terms of saying, Listen, um, I heard you talk about um about business. Um, have you thought about what type of business um that you want to get into? If not, um, can you check check YouTube for business ideas and maybe let's talk about it um in the next few days to see if maybe there's any way that I can support you. Um, because it doesn't help when we just give them um motivation that says we have everything in the house use it they're probably not going to use them so give them tasks and give them activities to do and just be present in terms of checking and following up on those things without coming across as um instructive and and demanding and you know because when i didn't like that kind of tone it's interesting that we almost have to um we almost have to be to treat them like mama and like ex but all it does is it, you're pushing the responsibility back at them by not doing the work for them because the minute you do the work for them they get back to that state where they don't get motivated to do anything for themselves so i give them the tasks and the activities but i just monitor what they do afterwards um yes yes teach independence yes um how best to connect with your young adult at university? Oh yeah, so Zadra, here's the thing. In terms of connecting with your young adults, it depends on two things. One, before they left um, home for varsity, were they leaving to explore um, um, the world out there in terms of education and life, or were they running away from home? Because what tends to make um, young people not come back often is because home probably was not nice, or home was not comfortable, or home was um, was tense. Um, and and they when they finished matric, their biggest drive and goal is to be as far away from home as possible. So you literally need to check first. Which, was there anything? Or is there anything within the family unit that could make them not want to come back? But even if there is, it's fine, but you just need to be aware of first because if there's a big thing that is dragging them out, you might need to find a way to address that big thing first before you expect them to be fluent um, and frequent in coming back home. And then what you then do to connect with them, you must create activities that's going to drive them back home. Activities can be anything like Prioritize doing birthday parties. I'm giving most the most basic. Prioritize hosting birthday parties for everyone, yeah? and encouraging the kids to come back home for each other's birthday parties. Pro like create new rituals for the family, and those rituals could be birthday parties. It could be um, pass parties, as in someone has passed an exam. You create pass pass mark parties. Or you just have certain rules that says every Easter, let's all be home, or everything, you know, let's all be home. But then if there's something that was driving them going away, when you do those get togethers or the first one, you must address the elephants in the room because those things, if they are not addressed, addressed properly, they then grow into bigger things and then could drive them away from home even more. Um, so that's what I'm that's my way of responding to your questions, Adwa. Mm. Um, okay, I'm checking other questions. I can't see my um
Another problem is where to draw a line between giving them support and being an enabler. An enabler. My son is 24 on an internship and sometimes I give him some money because I know everything is expensive. I actually hide it because I feel like I get judged when I do it. I don't feel like I'm, okay. I don't think I'm spoiling by others. I don't feel like, okay. First thing, I'm going to first, before you give him money, you have an open conversation about, about how he uses the little money that he has. Né? Find a way to be open about that conversation because if he is, say, he's earning um, 3.5 as his, 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 his stipend, né? and this 3.5 can cover his transportation to work and can cover his food to work, if you're giving them money, what are you giving them money for? So there needs to be a clarity in terms of your extra money, which gap is it filling? And also what are they doing with their money? Because what tends to happen with the younger dads, they tend to want to keep their money for a groove, which doesn't teach them responsibility. And you find that you are patching them up or they find of, they kind of get to a habit where they use your money um, for budgeting so when so they use your money for the responsible stuff and then they use their own money for other weird stuff so before you you give him more money first check Ukuti, how are they spending their money where does it go to so that when you give them your money you're able to say i'm giving you this one thousand rents to add to your transport or i'm giving you this two thousand rents to buy you clothes for this for the for, for your meetings and for your work so that it, it has a name and it has a meaning and a, a value. But if you give them money really nearly you are you are enabling them unfortunately. <laughs> um, um do I tell my mother that she is wrong when we don't see eye to eye with her parenting ways with my son? My response to that one is it depends who raised the son. Because sometimes if it is your mother who raised your son from a particular age, say from zero till they were preteens or teenagers, and then you took over like later on, whoever raised the child carries the biggest voice in terms of who they listen to and what they say. Because if your mom is the one who's been playing this primary caregiver role with your child, they will have the biggest voice and your child would listen to them the most. So you might end up saying to your mom that she's wrong, but you'd end up fighting just among the two of you for nothing because your son will still listen to the one with the bigger voice. So for me, I would say I don't have a straight answer for you because a lot of issue situations need to be taken into consideration. And then also be mindful that um, the, the mothers, the grandmothers, they tend to want to spoil their, their grandkids in any case. Um, but the biggest thing for me is who's got the bigger voice? Who is the primary caregiver? And who's had the primary audience with your son and for how long? And that will determine who they listen to the most. Né? Because it's, it's difficult to change our parents' parenting because one of them are stuck in their ways. Um, but a whole lot of things need to be taken into context and consideration before I give you a straight answer for that one. OK. Yes, yes. Once um, so once you pinpoint, um, I like your comment that says, I'll try and get to, get together and I can already pinpoint why home may have been a place to get away from. So um, Zodra, thank you for that point because that speaks to the other, the other point that often gets young adults um, depressed. And in my workspace, I call it knowledge gaps. Um, once your young person has too many knowledge gaps, it can work with their psyche in the most deepest ways. It can make them quit school. It can make them not function at work, not function anywhere because, because they've got lots of knowledge gaps. And what I mean by knowledge gaps is if they don't know who their father is, they don't know or they've never seen their father, they, 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 they don't have a conversation with them. 
They don't know much about his life. They don't know much about you as a mom. They don't know your family history. They don't know where you guys are coming from. They don't know why you're angry so much. They don't know why you guys broke up with their parents. They don't know why the divorce happened. They don't know why you are always sad and crying. You know, so if there's a lot of knowledge gaps that the kids have, it's going to impact how they show up in the world around them. It impacts the choices that they make, the decisions that they make because they're sitting in the space of not knowing much, not knowing themselves. And this is why you find that the best time to do self-discovery is in the young adult stage. Um, I hope this helps. Um, sorry, I'm running away from the internet. It's trying to close me down. So, so pay attention to what your children know and what they don't know about your family. And perhaps when they are young adults, unpack the family history for them. In its rawness, unpack, it's the best time, unpack the family history. The things that happened when they were children, um, the divorce, the reasons for the divorce, the reasons for the fights, if they witness you fighting with your husband physically, um, and have those uncomfortable conversations because even if you're not speaking about those things, they play in their minds and it, it creates um, an imprint in their subconscious because then they battle in terms of knowing who they are. Sometimes the things they witnessed created insecurity, insecurities within them, which makes it difficult for them to show up in the world around them. So knowledge gaps. Um, and also young adults, um, they tend to want to explore who they are um, and, and how to define themselves in the world around them. That's why you find that some would drop out because not because they are irresponsible, but because they're trying to find themselves and what is more, what speaks to them the most. Né? Um, and then what else did I write in my notes? Um, any other questions? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Anna. Um, please expand more on how you parent a child that has that has a parent sometimes. Okay, thank you for that for that question. Can I say this? If this child already has a parent, please do not parent them. You you are not the parent. Ne? You are not the parent. Don't parent them. Don't parent them. Ne? So in your case, Baba, you mentioned that you um, she's a nephew. So meaning ungu magazi, we call it magazi in Fosa, meaning you are a co-facilit, co-parent <laughs> and not then the actual parent. Né? But then the deeper part of it is that you become, a, in, in, in the African culture, you become um, almost like the co-parent uh, or, you, or you play the parenting role when the biological parent has passed away. But when that parent is still alive, you do not play the parenting role you stick with your support role because once you cross um, the roles and play a role that is not meant for you, you're gonna make mistakes. So my, my point is do not parent them. Né? Stay within your role as a magazine or, um, or, or um, um, as the support to, to, to their mom so that you're able to give them the proper support because once you move to that space of parenting them, they are not going to be in a space to receive because you're not the parent. So maybe let's let's shift our language. You don't parent them, but you support them. Yeah? Um, and this is important because it's gonna shift your mindset and how you approach them. Because I find when we prematurely move to a parenting role, we mimic how the other parent does things. We become strict, we become this, you know, we, become, we, we, we tend to want to embody how the other parent should have been doing things and it doesn't come across as authentic and then the children tend to repel or rebel against you. So don't parent but stay in a supporting role and be okay with saying, you know what, I'm trying, um, is, is there any way that I can, but is there anything that I can do to support you? Um, or is there anything that you'd like your mom to support you with so that you become the bridge between the son and their mother? Because then if we shift the road where we become the parents, you're leaving the mom in a space where they don't play their role as they should. And that becomes 
a gap for the child because now who call this gap of a mom that they don't know how to read or in, in, inter, in, interact with because the mom has been overtaken taken by somebody else. So don't play the parent, play your supporting role and then become the bridge between the child and the mom. And also it's going to depend on the context of the family and the history of the family. I'll make an example. Um, there's a child that I'm coaching. Um, the, the, the mom is sitting in another province and she's staying with another some of the, of the other kids. And then the son is staying with the sister of the mom in another province. And she's playing that role. So based on the context of the family, this one is always going to be angry at the absent mom based on him not knowing the history of why is my mom absent and why is she not playing the role that she's supposed to be playing and why is she taking care of other kids but ignoring me. And those why, why, why are going to drive the decisions that this person makes. So most of the time, it's not that they are um, they are irresponsible, but they've got too much in their mind that says, but why is this person not coming on board? Do they not love me? Am I not deserving of love? And those are responses that you cannot give because you're not the biological parent, more so when that biological parent is still alive and is a mother. So what you then do, you try and figure out what questions does your nephew have with regards to the mom, to the history of the family, and where things are sitting right now within the family. What do I need to assist my nephew to understand, to unpack so that he's at peace with himself? Because when a young person is not at peace with themselves, they're gonna create havoc in terms of how they make decisions and everything else around them. I hope that helps you. I hope that helps you. So then also, also it's gonna depend on you as sisters and your relationships, how do you relate together? If you have your own dramas, né? if you have your own dramas, it's going to impact how you support the son as well. And also if the son knows this history of me in terms of the drama and, the, and, and that you guys have, it's gonna make them find it difficult to listen to both of you because they're gonna label you in a particular way and put you in a particular corner, which would then make supporting them very, very difficult. As I'm saying, be the bridge and figure out how to get your sister to play their motherly role while you support both of them. And also this is quite broad because um, I would have to ask you maybe, maybe because we know each other, maybe um, also like Pearl contact me because I need to understand the context of everything. How did it happen that you are the one supporting the son? Where is the mom? What is the mom doing? And, 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 or are you supporting the child financially and the mom can't? Because sometimes what we do in our families, the ones with money tend to, um, to stifle the ones who do not have money and who want to take over. And then it kind of shuts out the other parent and they don't know how to then play because you are the one who's, who's got the money and then they have to be sitting and begging for your support so they don't want to rock the boat. And yet you might be unintentionally pulling them in their role. And what you need to do or what some people need to do is you can offer the money in terms of if that's what is needed as a resource to support this child, but then you still allow the parent to play the parenting role while you support and become a bridge. It requires a certain type of wisdom and structure, and but also I would need to have full context, but yes, you can talk to me as well. Um, all right, so in closing, in closing, um, what we're going to do from the teen coaching side from next year, in fact, from a later next year, we're going to have a lot of um, young adults coaches, more so for college students and varsity students, because I'm worried about the high rate of um, suicide there, and it's getting deeper. It's getting deeper. You can even do your your your, your good research around um, suicide in events and Instagrams down. You see a lot of stuff happening there. Um, and also not just vets and, and there's also other institutions as well, but it's, yeah, I don't want to get into politics, but <laughs> it's there. Um, so we want to see if we can create um, centers of support for young adults that are going to varsity or college. And then we want to see if we can also support those that are 
out of school. Um, so one of the things that I've done very, very well is to link children who had the wrong subject choices um, from grade 12 who then go to college. They choose particular subjects in college and then they create a bridge between college and university because then sometimes um, some courses when they are done at colleges, they don't have the same weight as those that are done at varsity. It impacts in terms of employability later on. So it's less is in the So when we talk about career development, we talk about grade nine, grade 12, first year, second year, fourth year, because where your child starts um, their tertiary might be in college, but for certain courses, they might need to leave college and go to varsity as the only way. As, and if they stay in college, they will not be employable. And this is a fact about South Africa. So there are certain courses where I've said to young adults, leave, leave college, go to varsity. But for you to get to varsity, improve your marks. And then, so I've been successful in that space and also our team gets, gets involved. So if your child is in grade nine, pay attention to subject choices. If they're in grade 12, um, have a conversation around them being emotionally ready for, for tertiary and also be allowing of them learning to make decisions as well because that's the other thing we don't allow our, our kids to make decisions we always want to think for them and it doesn't help um and then and then questions before i i, I log out you can raise your hand and you can ask me a question i'm hoping this helps i, I didn't know how this was going to go um, I didn't know how this was going to go um, because it's a lot and I'm giving summaries because what I, what I wrote here in my notes was the emotional well-being is important and often it comes up, um, childhood traumas, they come up when they are young adults, inability to, to, um, to, to move forward, um, they lack an ability to make decisions for themselves, fear of making decisions, fear of failure and fear of success family dynamics, um, self-identity, questions known or unknown to them, and also realization of things that might have happened in the family. And, 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 and so Martin, Martin, please ask a question. Hi, yes, I would love to ask a question. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna make a few points and then ask my question. So, um, there is the the point about the trick that you use, um, for example, with that scenario of the child loving music, and then you tell them, um, if you pass metric, I'm gonna buy you a sound <laughs> system. Yes. And then, yeah, and then there is also that point um, about being an enabler. Uh, being watchful of not being an, an enabler of the wrong habits in the child or the wrong um, activities. Um, and then there is also another scenario that I'm just gonna put in for the sake of my question, where, mm -hmm. for example, say you are teaching um, your child at an earlier stage to learn yes. how to to drive so that maybe they get their license mm. at an early age with example to say maybe later on when they get their own car and they have to pay for insurance it would be beneficial for them because they've had the license for quite a long time mm. and hence they would pay a lower premium mm. um, and then um, a, a scenario where now this child knows how to drive, they have a license and they wanna go to the movies and they always wanna go to the movies alone, but ask for the car. Now <laughs> you, as a parent, you now start thinking, okay, do I now have to go watch movies with this child because I've taught them how to drive and now they can drive and now they wanna use the car by themselves and go watch movies. Mm. And then now my question around all these scenarios or points that I've made is, to what extent do you um, do you support or enable certain things at an early stage to the child without um, putting them out of direction or without mm -hmm. 
misleading them or even over spoiling them, um, um, if I may call it that, because some of these things we do them with pure intentions to yes. support them or build um, them, but they turn out to be over spoiled and engage in other activities outside of what we're teaching them. I'll take, I'll take the example of a car. Um, so one of the best ways um, in that scenario is to teach responsibility in terms of cost and how much petrol costs. So, so, so that then needs to be an open conversation that says um, petrol is this amount. So I'll make an example based on how my dad used to do it. I'm not saying do the same thing. So when I was a teenager, my father had, um, had, had this wisdom of taking his, um, his pay, pay slip, um, his full on pay slip. And he called us in as his kids and placed his pay slip here. And he says, kids, I'm earning 4,000 rands, an example. I'm earning 4,000 rands from, from my salary, um, from my workplace. And in this 4,000 rands, we pay 1,000 rands for rent and we pay 1,000 rands for electricity um, and, 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 and. And then she, he would, and then we will all chip in, in terms of um, what then is left behind in terms of what we need. Um, because then what was wise about that is that it taught us what money is not coming down from a tree and that there's a certain set amount that my dad has on a monthly basis. And we need to be wise in terms of how we spend that because if we don't do it properly, we won't have enough. So I would say it would be spoiling your child if we give them the car with no consequences and no conversation. And by that, I'm not meaning, because um, sometimes we do this thing where we correct our children when we are angry because we didn't set the boundaries in the first place where we say, oh, but you keep taking this car and it's very expensive and you're eating my money, you know, because now we did not create that basic foundation around conversation that says, okay, now that you've really learned and you know how to drive, it doesn't mean that I'll be able to give you my car all the time, but there are certain situations where I would need you to drive around and certain situations. So, so I think what sometimes we lack in, we lack in creating boundaries with our children. And then what they do, they then learn to take advantage of us because we have not set any boundaries in place. So you would then need to say, petrol is expensive and costly. So no, you can't go to the movies all the time. There's a taxi and another option that you can use, Uber or whatnot. And no, you can't go to movies all every weekend because movies are expensive and, and, and. So I think also we might need to challenge ourselves to talk about um, finances and about responsibility. I like what the other parent said earlier on, um, Umpo, when she said that her, her young adult is um, working um, got a part-time job. Sometimes you literally have to say, if you need to use the car often, um, get a weekend job somewhere so that you pay for part of the petrol. Um, and you will not be ruining your child for saying so. Um, and also, if you, your child is, is, is driving your car, are they written as part of the insurance for the car? If something happens, um, are they aware that you would need to pay for that as well? So what I'm saying is, um, yes, you can spoil them, but also find a way to teach them responsibility. Because if you don't do so, you're not creating boundaries. And also you're teaching them that everything is free for all. They can do whatever they want. And we all know that the world is not like that. It doesn't mean that you're stingy. Um, it means that you, you're teaching them responsibility. And you can agree to say, I'll allow you to use the car at least once, once a month at no cost to you, but anything else, I need you to come on board in terms of responsibility. I hope that helps you, Martin. Any yeah, that's questions? wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. I know I know. also um, the ODD can be quite, um, by a spoiler, ODD, by a spoiler. I know I was raised by a dad who spoiled me a lot. <laughs> so so once in a while, it just requires you to, to build a um, foundation in terms of boundaries. Isn't it? Um, hi, Ajian, you've been quiet. Let me know if you wanna say something. A question. Um, Dima Hi, Noveli. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Uh, unfortunately, I just got in. I've been near the lobby for a long time and I had given up. Yeah, I just want to find that I'm a grandmother. Yes. Yeah. I just want to find out all these interventions that you are alluding to. Mm. They are very helpful. 
Mm-hmm. What what should one do if the interventions come from one side, like from the mother's side and the father is just like, ah, he's quiet. You know, he, he, you know, he's not, uh, it's like, he doesn't see anything. He doesn't hear anything. And it's only the mother who's trying to do this and this, advise this and this, do this and this. What is the way forward? Um, we also call that absence um, when a father or a parent is present but absent. Um, so the only thing that a person can do, the one who's fully present must just do the work that they need to do because it, it's not going to help if you almost um, are competing about who needs to do what. It's going to derail you a lot. So the mom who's choosing to be fully present in assisting the child must work together with the child in terms of getting things done. You know? Because the other thing is, if the other person doesn't see the need or the value, then you're going to struggle. And what you don't want, you, you, you're going to feel horrible if um, you did not do anything when you could, um, because that's the other thing. Um, the, the danger these days is that if our children are idle for too long, when we could intervene, there's the presence of drugs now um, and all sorts of stuff that take over. Um, so without scaring you, you also want to ensure that you've done your part properly so that you know whatever happens that your child, at least they chose their part. So what I'm saying is um, don't look at who's not doing what. Um, the one who's fully present must do the work in terms of the children. And then they can do their own work as a couple to either get their own relationship coach or marriage coach to say, but how are we not um, parenting our children and what can we do differently? But it cannot happen at the expense of the children though. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mama. Um, another person, any other question? I think I will close at half past, I don't mind sitting until half past seven. Um, if anyone wants to leave, they can do so, but I wanna see if I can ask, take one last question and then I'll leave. Um, any other hands up? Let me just check. There's one hand up. I see Uvuvu, but I want to take a different person. Uvuvu, I've spoken to her before. <laughs> I want to take another person. Um, so one of the things I wanted to say as well, if we look at the global scheme of things, yes, I must talk about this because it bothers me. It bothers me, guys. When we look at the global scheme of things, when you talk about digital entrepreneurship, our children are not featured in vain at all. Um, if you look in the global, so one of the things that COVID did for us, which is a great thing, COVID opened up the global world for us in the sense that I can have a client in the USA, I can have a client in Kenya, and I can have a client in Nigeria, you know, um, and using digital platforms in different forms. So there's one platform tool that I use a lot in terms of when I need work to be done fast. It's called Fiverr as an example. And what I've noticed throughout the years is that the young people that feature the most in those platforms are young people from Nigeria, they lead there, and young people from Kenya, and young people from, 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 from Tanzania, and then young people from Botswana and Namibia, they are leading in those spaces. And our young people do not feature them at all at all, at all, at all, which I find quite sad because it means that um, we, our children are missing out on a lot of things when it comes to digital entrepreneurship. But also, Tina, in the country, we also have a weird relationship with technology in the sense that we don't want our kids to have smartphones. We, we don't want our kids touching smartphones. We don't want our kids opening social media platforms. We don't want them online at all. They must be 18 first before they get online. But by the time they're 18, other kids are excelling already. They have profiles, they have, they have testimonials, they have um, um, portfolios of their work that they can present. So when I'm looking for talent, I'm not gonna take one from SA because I know Guti, they don't, they don't even have any evidence of work um, that's being done. And yet the other children from other countries 
are doing so much more. So what I'm saying is that one, if you have um, teenagers, please allow them to explore the world of social media, digital entrepreneurship, um, and everything else around that. And also, let's put into context our own fears around um, social media interactions because our children are missing out on a lot of things. Tina Sasaba on TikTok, no YouTube, and other kids, by the time they're 10 years of age, they're earning dollars already from Facebook ads and from YouTube ads and from TikTok ads and Tina Sasaba all the time. And then, um, and, then, and, and then, so I'm gonna give you guys a challenge to explore those platforms as well so that as a parent, you know what's out there and it's taking notes as well because it doesn't help to be afraid for your kids, but you don't know what they should be afraid of. So that's my challenge to you guys as well. Um, and then that should be it. Thank you. I think I'm gonna try and do this um, maybe once every two months. Um, but the reason why I wanted to do this mostly was because we are embarking on focusing on coaching young adults. But at the same time, I always feel like parents are not given attention in terms of what do you do to support the young adult. So in summary, give them resources um, to explore what they need to explore about themselves. Always keep your house open without you doing too much. No. Keep your, eye, your, your home open and keep your heart open so that when they get stuck in life, they can always drive back home. Give them tools, like give them laptops if they need so. Give them a smartphone, give them data, but don't overgive if they're not showing any effort in terms of um, coming on board and what you're trying to do for them. And then lastly, create open channels of communication because the more they grow, the more they need you. And the more they grow, the more questions they have. And we don't want to be that generation of parents that freak out and faint and cry when they, when they ask, Gonje, who's my dad? You know, we freak out, we cry, we faint and do crazy stuff because we don't want to talk about tough stuff. So let's, let's, not, be, let's not be those, um, those parents, but let's create open channels of communication. And if you cannot afford things like coaching services like, like me, because I know sometimes and um, sometimes the leader in this platform, if you cannot, um, if you cannot, you know, please look around your community for support programs and then just nudge your young person to get in there. Look around you. And also, even if um, it's not me, you'd find that there are other life coaches that provide similar services that could be much more closer to you and then get them on board. So the other nice thing on my side is that now we have teen coaches that don't charge the same as I do and you can defer them. Also, what we'll probably do as well, I'll do um, a roll call where we take free um, free clients once in a while for the incoming team coaches that are learning so that your, your children can benefit from that service. But most importantly, we must keep them active. We must keep them occupied and exploring the world around them. If your child is depressed, um, get them support and preferably get them to a psychologist um, because they need that support. And then lastly, um, if your child has explored drugs, read mostly weed because weed is a thing for some reason. And if they've been smoking for more than three years, please try and convince them to get to rehab. Um, most so if it's, if it's impacting their behavior and how they act up because life coaches cannot support um, young people with, that are doing drugs, but get them to, to get to go to rehab and get them to understand the reasoning why they should go to rehab because that's necessary um, because no one can work with them without that. And then lastly, um, you don't have to do everything as a parent. You can step back and focus on parenting and allow them support from your friends. The other thing that I've noticed that we don't do in South Africa, <coughs> we don't open up our friends for our kids. And I mean, those that we trust. You'll find that sometimes your friends, they work in top companies um, and have certain qualifications. Ask your friends to give your kids job shadowing opportunities and ask them to, to, to at least have conversations with them around career options as well. Because you don't have to pay for everything. You can talk to your friends and see if they'll be open to a conversation with your kids. Or as a group of friends, swap your kids around so they can have conversations with different people within your, your close friendship group. Because then there's no point 
if you have friends that you can't trust with your kids, then you don't need to keep those people. So swap people around and see who can listen to your child in a particular way. Mm -hmm. I hope this helps. I hope this helps. I hope this helps. Um, thank you so much. I don't think there's any other questions, ne? Before in the hand. Eh? Bui, is that a hand? Nope, it was an applaud. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, no one else, no one else, no one else. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you so much. Please have a wonderful day. Umbane, umbane, we let so Lord Shetting just came back, so I'm happy. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs> thank you. Stay blessed. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Bye. Paul, thank, thank you for joining. Thank you. Adrian, I hope you, you speak next time. <laughs> Hi, this is V. Hello. Hello. Um, before you leave, sorry, yes. there's some people that I Hello. 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 Yes, ma'am, I'm listening. Um, that I sent, I forwarded the link to this session, right? Because I'm signed up to your newsletter, so that's why I, I I got the link. Okay. Someone has just put if um inform them of um further details on how to make a booking. Okay, so I'll do can so. I direct yes, Mama, you can, you, can, you can direct them to me. What I also do is I'm going to try and save this somewhere so they can listen to this video as well. Ne? All right, so you will okay. get this in the news. Yes, in the uh, newsletter, link. yes. Yes, Mama, yes. I'll send an email tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Thank you, Susie. Thank you so Thank much you, for the session. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you, Nelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Very informative. I'm thank glad. You. Thank you so much. I'm glad. Bye. Bye. Thank you, V. I'm waiting for everyone to leave before I exit. So bye. <laughs> bye. 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 Hey. Can you tell them that I'm too close to you, Peter?